Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this 123rd episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guests on this episode include singer-songwriter Minnie Murphy. We'll be talking about her new single, Get Over It. We'll also visit with luxury builder, the ultimate home creator, some might call him, Scott Hamilton Harris. In our monthly visit, we'll take some viewer questions as well. If you would, please take the time to subscribe, comment, leave some feedback, check out the shop, and share with your friends. Now, Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis took heat last week for saying they don't bathe their kids unless they're visibly dirty. Then Kristen Bell and Dax Shepard said they sometimes wait until their kids start to stink. But let's ignore the parenting aspect for a minute and focus on ourselves. How often do you shower? A new poll asked over 5,000 Americans, and not all of us do it every day. Over a third say they don't usually shower that regularly. 62% of us shower at least once a day including 11% who said more than once, but 20% said every two days, 6% said three, 2% said four, another 2% said every five days, 1% said six, and 3% said once a week or less. A singer, songwriter, got a brand new single just released a couple weeks ago called Get Over It. Minnie Murphy on the line with us today. And first off, Minnie, I appreciate you taking some time to be on the show. Well, I appreciate you taking time for me, and I'm so happy to talk to you and hope you're having a good Friday. So far, so Friday good. The 13th. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, man. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't notice that until like yesterday, but are, are you one of those that believes in the Friday the 13th and the jinxes and all that stuff? No, not really. <laughs> I mean, I just noticed it this morning, too, <laughs> but I don't have any spooky plans for it or anything. But. You say that now. <laughs> you say that now. We we know what's right. really in store, right? <laughs> Hopefully uh, nothing too crazy happens. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Now, Minnie, when did music for you, when was music introduced into your life? Was it something that you don't even remember being introduced, I guess? Yeah, I mean, my, my dad plays guitar and my mom plays piano, and that's how they made their living growing up as a kid in, in the Northwest, uh, they played, um, around all the local bars and taverns of, of Bellingham, Washington. And, and my mom was always playing the piano in the house. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, music's everywhere too. I mean, just hearing it on the radio, I, I was always drawn to it. And, um, I think my parents would, would play all night in the bars and we would be at home and I would just listen to my favorite singers and try to copy the way they sing and practice my runs. And then I started taking piano lessons when I was 10 and, um, I just got hooked on that. I, once I figured out the basic theory I, and was able to start writing, I, I knew that early on that it's what I wanted to do. Now for you, many, so. which is, which is your preferred instrument when you're writing? I mean, I know some piano players prefer a guitar. What's your preferred? Either one at this point, but, um, I started off on piano and then I picked up the guitar in high school and I kind of thought that it would help me get a little more up tempos going on because the <laughs> piano was kind of like a, a, a rainy day therapist <laughs> for me, you know, I get kind of moody on that. But writing country songs, a lot of the time I'll use the guitar because you can get a little more percussive with that. But um, if I'm trying to find a chord in my head that I hear that I can't figure out on the guitar, I usually go to the piano for that because... I have a better understanding. That's my son in the background screaming. Sorry. <laughs> I got a little boy threw his watermelon on the floor. <laughs> when he wants attention, everything gets thrown on the floor. <laughs> he said, he but, said, Hey um, mom, did you remember it's Friday the 13th? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in Nashville for, for about 10 years. And for, for you, I've heard a lot of folks say that Nashville, you got to have a 10 year plan. I mean, and you're a perfect example of that. And, and how hard is it in Nashville to, to keep going in the, in the lean times, if you will. 
Well, you know, I've actually been here for 18 years. And um, when I moved here, I had a record deal on Sony. And I got that in high school. And I was pretty ignorant. You know, I was already planning my acceptance speeches and <laughs> thinking about my videos and all this stupid stuff. But um, <laughs> I quickly learned, you know, like, because Sony merged with RCA and I lost that deal. I wasn't able to put out that music and then um so i kind of had a different experience in a way but at the same time you know going through that and going back to waiting tables and and then just gigging for a living you know i i appreciate all those times because that's where you really uh learn you know you there's there's really no difference. It's just about like how much you love it, how much work you put in, and and um, I think there's room for everybody. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, all we have is is the body of work that we've created, and right. we're left with the music. And and I I feel like if you're happy with that, then you've made it, you know. And because these days anybody can put themselves out there, and right. and that's a beautiful thing. So. And you talked about the the different genres as well, and I know that you've been influenced by so many different genres. and And do you think that that maybe helps you maybe fit into the country genre where it's at today? I mean, yeah i I've always struggled with the reason why I wanted to do music in the first place is because it represents freedom to me. You know, like freedom of expression. You can mm-hmm. say and do and be anything you want to be and um so i'm drawn to it all i i like the artists that reinvent themselves and do concept albums and um this country project is kind of a it's a throwback classic sound so it's kind of a concept project and um but i still have a jazz trio and i love improv i love scatting and r&b and i've done some some punk rock stuff and <laughs> growing up in the Northwest. I love all that alternative. I just feel like, you know, good music is good music in any genre, but I know people get a little territorial about that, but I think if something's authentic, why not do it all? I mean, like Bruno Mars has his little side <laughs> project with, I mean, he's a humongous superstar, but <laughs> he can do anything he wants. But, um, <laughs> But anybody can do whatever they want, you know. I've I've done like some big band swing stuff and I think all like just that's the great thing about doing music is you can there's always something new to learn, there's always a new instrument to get better at and but I love country because it's part of my roots. Of course my sister Jamie is a big country star and then my dad's always played it. I grew up listening to him play that uh, country rock kind of stuff and classic rock and I get the kind of jazz and blues from my mom so I've always tried to infuse I think when I was on Sony I was excited to sort of be the kind of the Nora Jones of country and mm-hmm. had an upright bass and it was kind of jazzy and but still country but it was a little bit outside of the box for them <laughs> at the time but I like it all. I mean, I love what's going on with the pop country, too, and I write a lot of that. But I just kind of have a soft spot for the more classic retro, you know, like Merle Haggard and (laughs) whatever, you know. The the steel guitar, you know. I love the stories and the heartbreak and the honesty. and, And I also think that, like, going through becoming a mom and the whole lockdown with the pandemic, I felt like that familiar nostalgic kind of country was really comforting to me as a, as a new mom and just brings me back to the family upbringing and, and um, just feels like an old friend kind of thing. So now many, this, this last year as a songwriter as well, and also doing so many different genres, I want to get your take. How do you think that the music is going to reflect what we've all gone through this last year? Well, I mean, I feel like it kind of leveled the playing field and made people appreciate what they have. And, you know, I think uh, it was motivating for me. Um, 
a lot of that was becoming a mom too. But right. uh, I think, you know, one of my best friends, like he, his name is Mr. AJ Wells. He, he did his album during the pandemic and everything. And we talked about that, how it kind of fueled us, you know, it kind of forces you to go back within yourself. And that's always a creative place, you know, and, so I think there'll be a lot of great music coming out and a lot of uh, passion, and I'm excited. It's a, it's a great time, you know. Now tell us for the writing process of Get Over It. I know that you wrote this with Don and, and, and Drafton as well, and what was the process, what was the thought process going into the ride, if you will? It was just another day at the office, really. I mean, my publisher, his partner will sometimes give him song titles and um so that's how this song he said don bedell's got this title get over it and y'all need to write it and so we thought about it and um you know just kind of wanted to it felt like you know just um that classic heartbreak kind of old school music Mm -hmm. progression that that feels kind of just like that you know, when you just go into a dive bar and you and you sit up at the bar and, and, you know, the person next to you, you know, they have a whole life story of all the things they've gone through and, and who knows, you know, where their heart's at. But like the type of song that that person would put on, you know, as they're drinking their beer and lamenting or something, you know, and <laughs> it's, it's kind of that mid-tempo. It's easy to listen to and... um it's not too clever, you know, it's just kind of straightforward, you know. And But I also think that there's an honesty about trying to numb the pain and, and uh, despite the consequences. I mean, you know, I know I've been there, so <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I can relate to it. And we all have that part of ourselves that does that, you know. That's right. Now, if folks want to find more information, not only about the single, about other works you got coming up, uh, upcoming tour dates as those become available. Where's the best place? I know, uh, social media website and all that as well. Yeah. Um, so all my socials are, uh, Minnie Murphy music, except for my YouTube. It's just Minnie Murphy. And so I have a mini Murphy music.com slash page right now, and it can direct you to where to buy all the music and, um, and upcoming events and live streams and, and uh, lots more surprises. We're going to put out more songs off off the LP. And uh, I'm getting ready to do a Spanish version of the song. Hmm. I'm excited about it. <laughs> My best friend speaks fluent Spanish, so she's translating it for me. It's called Superalo, which means get over it in, <laughs> in Spanish. So. <laughs> I can't. I got to work on my pronunciation. But, yeah, Minnie Murphy Music is my Instagram, Facebook, and like you, I, I do have a TikTok, but I'm I'm just now getting into that. I'm, <laughs> it's overwhelming, all the different things that you can do now. It's a lot to keep up with, but it's nice to be able to have the way to get to many so many people. Yep, that that is true. Well, Minnie, it has been great to visit with you today. I appreciate you taking some time with us, and hopefully you have a great weekend, and hopefully we can catch up again real soon. You too. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. We do want to say thanks to our sponsor of today's episode, Smiley's Breezy Vapes. They're located at 313 Falcon Road in Altus, where they have Wacky Wednesdays. Stop by. They've got great specials each day, plus, like I said, Wacky Wednesdays. They've got new hardware and the largest selection of disposable flavors in Southwest Oklahoma. For more information, you can call or text 580-471-VAPE. That's 580-471-8273. Smiley's Breezy Vapes, 313 Falcon Road, here in Altus. Well, if pancakes and beer sound like a fun pair, IHOP has you covered. They just announced they're adding beer, wine, and champagne to their menu at some locations. Only a dozen are doing it right away, but if it goes well, they eventually want to do it at most of their restaurants in the U.S. They won't be offering liquor because they don't want it to feel like a bar, and they say it's mostly meant for people who come in later in the day. 
but it also seems like they want IHOP to become more of a brunch spot. In a promo photo they posted shows someone pouring a mimosa. Now, two locations in New Mexico are doing it this week. Another one in San Diego will add alcohol next month, and nine more will do it by the end of the year. The beers they're adding are Bud Light, Blue Moon, and Corona. The two champagnes are Barefoot Bubbly Brute and Barefoot Bubbly Chardonnay, and they're adding red wine to a Barefoot Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, some locations might have local beers too, and they're going to suggest different pairings, like French Frost and Mimosas, or a Corona with your spicy Poblano omelette. A friend of the show, going to be a recurring monthly guest. He is luxury builder, the ultimate home creator. Scott Hamilton Harris back with us again. And Scott, good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, Cameron. Place is looking good. It's great to see you. Yeah, uh, aside from uh, I need to declutter a little bit, but uh, but hey, that's that's kind of stuff we're going to be talking about, right? That's it. Let's talk about it. I mean, you could you deserve a luxury home as well. <laughs> That's one of the things we're going to talk about is some some do-it-yourself ideas. Each month, I uh, reached out to Scott to talk about uh, some great ideas. And also, if folks give him questions that he thinks ought to be shared with others, we're going to share those with you as well. And uh, Scott, first off, I just want to ask about how pricing is in the industry right now. I know seems like so many places are having struggles getting products too. And then the right. uh, trickle down effect on the, on costs as well. Is that inflating prices, if you will? Uh, oh, it's kind of, it, it is, it's like a roller coaster in Dubai right now. That, that's what it's been like. Um, you know, lumber prices, everybody knew they just went through the roof. They were up 200% and then they come down, you know, 80%. Everybody's excited. Um, we've been dealing with it pretty well. I would say, uh, but uh, look, I'll be honest. I think there's some greed out there, you know, but it's not like there's a shortage of trees. They didn't suddenly, you know, they didn't get sick from COVID and <laughs> it's all about supply and demand. You know, look, people are going to charge what they can get on these products. And so as soon as the supply goes down and the demand goes up, prices will go up, right? As soon as the lumber and everything's sitting on the shelf for a while, people stop buying, price starts to decline. So it's been a little challenging, you know, navigating the market, trying to time it. Uh, we've got a home that we're doing that's all steel, uh, traditional home, but it's all steel, steel studs, steel beams. I mean, it looks like a like a high rise, low rise building. <laughs> um, and it's been challenging to buy it out. And what I'll tell you, the challenge is to get clients to understand that, too, because what happens is clients. Oh, come on. Really? You know, the price, should, you know, no, it really did. So. <laughs> We're spending a lot of our time now having to explain to clients why the prices are fluctuating. Um, they don't ask questions when it drops. That's the good thing. Only when it goes up. Now, are there things other than, I know lumber is the one that, that we've heard the most about. Are there other products that you're seeing a, a, a price increase in over the last few months? Uh, yeah, therapy. Therapy has gone up a lot. <laughs> There's a high demand for it now. Everybody needs it. Uh, it's part of our industry. <laughs> And there's a short demand, but, uh, you know, steel was one commodity. Look, they're commodities, right? So they, um, steel was something that went up, but it actually did come back down. Um, and interestingly enough, we're finding it's less expensive to build a home in steel than it is in wood right now. Um, you know, there were some shortages on glass that we were dealing with. And I'll say really it more comes down to quality control issues. Is that what we're seeing? Because a lot of the people, you know, the government created this wonderful unemployment program. So, hey, why not enjoy it, right? And so a lot of people just dipped into that one. And, you know, when you've got these workers that are in these factories, they'd rather stay home, you know, and God bless them and instead of getting COVID, good for them. And, but then when they called everybody back to the workforce, you're seeing quality control issues. And so that's been another thing that's not really talked about, you know, 80% of the glass is being rejected because it's just not up to par anymore. Wow. And so we're seeing that. And so therefore you have delays um, on that end, but you know, it's a challenge, but so what you work around it. It's for the big boys. <laughs> That's right. Now, are there any changes you've seen over the last few months over maybe the, the request that you're getting has, is there a hot new trend that is out there on the market now? Uh, grow rooms for uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> hot new trends. Let's see. You know, it's, 
Nah, you know, I, I haven't seen any hot new trends. I mean, I know everybody likes to talk about trends and, you know, and trendy being trendy is trendy in of itself. Um, it's, there's always new things that are coming out of the market. There's technology, but, you know, I think as we talked about before, the homes really aren't evolving as much as we'd like to, you know, it's more about branding. Um, I'm, I'm very happy because I actually got, you know, Alexa in my home and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I finally let her come in. We're having a she's, she's only in one room of our house. We keep her back in my daughter's room. We're having a relationship right now with Alexa, like, you know, <laughs> but it's great though, because what, what I'm seeing is, you know, as far as trends go, really what used to be available and or is available for our luxury home clients is now becoming available for everybody else, you know, even myself. And where, you know, we would spend $75,000 to do an autom home automation system for the lighting. And you would spend $200,000 for an AV automation system. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just sitting there in my bedroom on my phone and with Alexa and a few other apps and giving my life and information away. And I'm just, we're having a relationship. So it's nice. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it's, I think the fact that everything became so interconnected in the homes is really one of the biggest things that we're seeing. You know, you go to your sister's home and you see her new refrigerator with the camera and she's like, it told me the milk is out now. And that's great. And I bet you can buy it on Amazon too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Where'd you buy the refrigerator? Amazon. Uh-huh. Wait, who owns the grocery store? Whole Food. Yeah, Amazon. <laughs> All right. You know, so more convenience, uh, nothing as far as the infrastructure yet. And that's what I'm really, you know, we're looking to see and I'm working on with a group of people doing, but uh, yeah, bigger things that we're able to, the more wealthy are starting to kind of trickle down. Now we talked about uh, bringing some questions in and uh, you guys came prepared today, sent me over some questions. I, I'll, I'll question you with these and uh, let you give our answers. I, I know these are some that uh, are a particular interest to you. So uh, you ready for question one? Yeah, I didn't really see these much because I know the, the other group, they should put some together. So but go ahead. <laughs> All right. Our, our first question is from Allison G from Albany, New York. And uh, asked, uh, said, I'm going to be buying a home and need to hire an inspector to check out the potential home, but I'd like to know what to look for to make sure the inspector does what he's supposed to. That's a good question, Allison G. G. So um, when it comes to home inspectors, it's really important to note that a home inspector, their name is not, they really don't inspect your home, right? Um, and we've had a lot, it's made a lot of money for us. It's been great because I call a home inspector, a home auditor, <laughs> really. I mean, what they're doing is you have, a, and no disrespect, it's a great profession. You know, you go in, I've got a, I've got my little sheet there. I just mark off. Do I have 110 or 220? Click, you know, do I have HVAC, blown air, insulation, roofing, you know, uh, plumbing, and you go through the list. And so it's really, it, it's, What's happening is people believe their home has been inspected, right? right. And, you know, I, I, I've done home inspections only once on every project. I never get called back again because, and so a suggestion for you, Allison, get a contractor that you trust or get an architect because look, to be honest, a contractor is gonna be obligated and they're gonna be biased. They're gonna wanna tell you everything that's wrong so they can make money off of it but they're really gonna give you probably a better understanding of what's happening. You want both. Um, you know, I did a, when I was younger, I did a camera and I did a, someone asked me to do a home inspection for them. Like, God, I don't, I never did this before. You're walking <laughs> in, there's the home inspector and, and he's got his list and he's like, where's your license? Oh, I don't, don't have one. I'm just a general contractor, sorry. <laughs> 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 he's going through and i said what about this and so i just decided to stand by myself and go outside and shame because i didn't have his license <laughs> and i'm standing across the street he walks out and i'm looking i said how how did it check out great and did you ever notice the house is crooked what you know we all look the whole house was just sitting at an angle because nobody notices those things they're really not looking at the big picture literally uh when they're doing this so uh you know, and then I did decide to go get my own license just to show the guy up. But then I figured it was a 12 hour open book test, you know, 
So no disrespect to them, but you got to also understand, Allison, that what's happening is the people that are giving these people their jobs are the real estate agents. And a real estate agent is only going to give a job to somebody and recommend a home inspector that makes the sale go through. Because if they come through and their sales canceled, you're out of business, right? I mean, I've, I've done this for so many years with, I've been asked to do home inspections. And like I said, every real estate agent has asked me to do it once. So, because the sale has yet to ever go through when I've inspected one. That is not what they're looking for. No, no. I had one project where, you know, I realized this isn't good for me because I just keep canceling the sales. Not good for economy. <laughs> I had one client and he said, sir, you just gave me all of your perspective on what happened, sir, but um, I don't. I need the real Scott Hamilton Harris to go out there and check this thing. You didn't give me enough dirt. Get your nose back out there and do it. I went back out there. All right, so this and the foundation is settling, and you've got to make – there we go. Sale canceled. Good. <laughs> you got a reputation that precedes you is what you're telling yeah. me. So, Allison, talk to a contractor. Talk to two contractors. Get a home inspector because you have to for the banks, right? It's just a regulation. But talk to uh, – get a, get a general contractor that you trust. All right. Well, there's one. And uh, we got a couple more lined up here. Uh, Ray from Phoenix, Arizona, and said that they're revamping their exterior and to try and bump up their property value to sell their home. They say, what do you suggest what to focus on to put their money into? Uh, Ray from Arizona. You know, I would say, why don't we do a big saguaro cat? Ray, we'll do an array of saguaro cactus out there for you. Uh, no, but with all seriousness, it's you know, what people look for, interestingly enough, in these homes is they're looking for, for curb appeal. Besides the front door, I've written about this, talk about it all the time. Um, don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's the landscaping. And where most people don't do so well is that tree that they brought back or someone else's tree, and they just can't stand to see it let it go. And, you know, the bush is, and then you tell them that's not a tree, it's a bush. It was never meant to be 14 feet in front of your living room window. I know you've fallen in love with it. The gardener has been shaping it into wonderful shapes through the years. Your husband, you know, took a whack at it and it's better, but you want to clear that out, right? You know, if you can go through and clear out all of those things and did some new plantings, it gives it a more resort like feel. Um, it's just interesting. People kind of like, you know, little groupings of plants, um, huge difference. It's, you know, you're, you don't want to spend all that money on your house um, because it's just be, can become enormous if you're trying to, if you're looking for curb appeal. You know, it's like a not so beautiful woman putting on a beautiful dress. No disrespect to all women are beautiful, but you know, it really, <laughs> it's, it really does significantly change your perspective. Also front door, you know, the front door is the thing you stand about as you're, you're making your deals, as you're talking. It's the thing you come through every day. It's the thing that you leave through every day. A beautiful door handle and a paint job on that door and a nice bold color, not pink, you know, but the nice deep rich colors like a burgundy or a wine, you know, or just the perfect shade of like uh, Tiffany blue. We actually, one of our clients gave us her Tiffany box and she said, this is the color I want for my front door. And it's just, there's an elegance, you know, when he did a nice new brass knob on there. Those things are actually reasonable to do, Ray. Um, I don't know what you do in Arizona. You know, maybe it's an array of agave <laughs> or something, <laughs> or maybe your agave plant got too big. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then, you know, there's, there's great options now on lighting that makes a huge difference. I mean, uh, up lights are always better than down lights. You know, if you do, if you've got a few small trees or bushes and you put a couple up lights, it's like, uh, you know, luxury living just in of itself by that in the evening. So I would try that. Now, when you talk about the exterior lighting, are you talking about wired lighting? Do you subscribe also? Are there any solars out there that will actually work like a wired light? Uh, you know, it's not cost efficient. You know, the, the, the size of the array of the panel you need to actually uplight it. You need a significant amount of light to do an uplight. And so, but it's, it's really simple. I mean, I just did it myself. Wait, I do this for a living, so I guess it's not fair. 
but <laughs> look, all I did, you know, it's just, it's a couple hour project. You buy this thing called a transformer, you plug it into a plug outside, you take a long cord, you know, a landscape cord, right? And you can just, if you're lazy, you can just kind of lay it along the, the bricks. You don't actually have to bury it. And you get these lights and they've got little clips on them and you just snap on wherever you want. You know, it's like, if you can roll your hose out, you can roll, you can roll out one of these little wires and lines. It's really easy to do. Anybody can do that one. Well, yeah. I think you just put, you put a challenge to me is what you just did. A couple hundred bucks. I want to see your, yeah. I'll give you the $200 <laughs> uh, exterior lighting challenge, Cameron. You'll, you you'll, <laughs> you'll love your home at night. Up lights are always better than down lights. There, I, I learned something. There you go. Good. Now, next is, I hope I pronounced the, the city right. It's Amber in San Gabriel, California. Uh, uh, it says, do you have any suggestions to turn their backyard into a mini getaway? They're thinking about uh, a built-in barbecue and uh, whatever like that. Ah, uh, mini getaway. I guess, let's see. Yeah, you know, the backyards are... And I did this for my house, but it's really about the five senses. It's, uh, you know, what you can see, what you can hear, or what you smell, what you taste, what you touch. And if you can hit all of those senses, that's what happens in a resort. You know, the resorts themselves are not that amazing, but they know how to trigger. You know, there's a lot of money that goes into marketing. And when you're outside and you smell the jasmine or you smell that meat cooking, you know, and you can hear the music. And put Alexa, bring her outside. You know, she needs to get outside occasionally. <laughs> Take the girl out on a date in the backyard. <laughs> have a little bit, you know, and to have the food and the touch and, you know, the and to see things. It's that easy, right? It doesn't have to be expensive. You don't have to overwhelm yourself with stone and everything. But like when you go to a resort, they put a lot of money into pumping scents into the air. Um was in Vegas and I got to go to this special um, backdoor thing where, you know, Oprah and everybody lives the, the, the hidden MGM that no one's supposed to, oops, everybody knows about it now. <laughs> um, you know, it's like under a big dome. It's got the private airport and you walk in there and it smells like strawberry. Every, and they pump strawberry air in there. I was in Disneyland, you know, and my son pointed out to me, dad, you know, they're actually pumping out popcorn in the air and you're on Pirates of the Caribbean. They pump out a scent in the air make it have that kind of musky smell. Um, so you can do that with plants. You can do that with all kinds of things, you know, um, roses. Get the smell out there. Get the sounds out there with the music. Get the, bring some food, do barbecue. Uh, and fire pits, really easy, right? And sun, not so great, you know, for me. I don't know, maybe you too. It looks like you, but, you know, sun doesn't do so well for me. <laughs> and... A really nice thing to do is a, is a shade sale out there. Those are so easy to get. You know, tell Alexa to go on Amazon. She's about to do it right now. And you can get one of those. All you need to do is you take a couple wood posts, pressure treated. You can dig a hole. Here's the best thing. Take some dry, a bag of dry concrete. Don't even have to mix concrete. Put the dry concrete in, in a hose and then it becomes solid. And then you can just stretch your, your sail over there. Um, you're done. Like, so I want to see that from you, Cameron. Like, and wait, San Gabriel. I think in San Gabriel, there's an extensive amount of sun out there and skin cancer patients. So great area. Do the sunshade and try those tips. I think we had lived here about five years uh, and, and we have dogs that are always running in the backyard. We've got a big backyard. Uh, we had a swing set for our daughter and my, my wife never really walked around the backyard as far as a, a getaway place. And so anyway, she was back there getting out of the sun one day and in the back of the yard said, this would be a beautiful sitting area. Well, over the last two years, that's what we've done. We've converted our backyard. We've got a nice little sitting area with a fire pit and uh, the grill's still on the back porch, but uh, it, it it's working its way there. Oh, that's great. I love hearing that. You know, the way I look at it is people are so congested in their homes, right? And they think the home is just their boundaries. That's their box. And you know, they're afraid to step outside because they're worried about getting a bug bite, right? You know, mm -hmm. there's candles and stuff. Um, but if you open your eyes to that idea and make your backyard and your property actually all encompassing as a resort, that's how you live in a resort, right? Because, you know, you don't, when I'm in a resort, I don't sit in my hotel room. They make it very inviting. They encourage you to come out. 
So, so as you're doing, Cameron, make the backyard and your property all like congruous so you can just have it as one. And it's great. It's like, it's another, you just got a big room now in the back, right? And you don't have to spend as much for it. No, not near as much. That's for sure. Now we, we got one more question for you. Uh, okay. This one comes from Sal in Orange County, California. And they said, why have construction costs gone up so much, especially lumber? We talked a little bit about that earlier. So, yeah, well, Sal, it's called greed. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because we can. No, that's that's a joke. But, you know, there's that is the truth for a lot of people. They are now charging Sal what they um, whatever you're willing to pay. And it's been a hard it's been a hard few months or hard year for a lot of people. So if they have opportunity to charge more and you're willing to pay more, they're going to do it. Uh, I will represent that in my company. We do not do that. We're more like the uh, in and out franchise, just always give good service and charge a fair price. Um, but you're, you know, we find that even in the subcontractor industry right now that uh, there is a lot of greed out there if for lack of, I'm sure there's a better term I'll come up with after, but you know, <laughs> let's call it capitalism <laughs> or optimism. There you uh, go. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the, Here's something I want you to consider, right? Uh, you know, I had a client, we're doing a project and they said, well, the, the cost of framing has gone up considerably. So I should expect my home to be up considerably. I said, well, look, let's look at it this way. The framing is 10% of the overall cost of the home. He's like, that's true. Now the lumber is 50% of that 10% because you know, half of it's usually material, half of it's labor. The labor cost didn't go up exceptionally. It doesn't go up two or 300%. So now we're only talking about a variable of 5% on the house. And of that 5%, that one up, you know, 10 to 50%, we're only talking about two and a half to two and a half, seven and a half percent change. So I said, the fact that even with lumber doubling and doing what it's done or some of the materials, we're talking about a variable of about two and a half to 3%. And that's a negligible amount because when you're building a home, you know, you expect there to be a change in two to 3%. Mm -hmm. And I found a lot of clients are now saying, hey, I'm gonna stop. But when you recognize that, get your contractors or your subcontractors and say, hey, uh, that's kind of bogus. I'm gonna tell you because the material cost went up, but your labor cost did not triple. So let's start telling me what the, the material costs are so Sal, ask that question. You'll be the most popular guy with the general contractors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, Scott, if folks do have any questions uh, that they want us to answer, obviously they can, uh, they can log on to your website. I know uh, they can find more info there, yeah. social media as well. Of course, they can also, if you want, uh, if you have any questions, you can email those to, to us as well. Hit me up on socials. But uh, Scott, I always want to make sure and let folks know where to find more info website wise. Uh, it's Scott at, uh, the, the website is buildingcgroup.com. The name of the company is building construction group. So it's building C group. It just was too long of a website to have. So, <laughs> but man, it's been a pain to tell everyone building C group C D no, not no, it's C <laughs> and it's not S E E. No, no. Yeah. No, I had more of my day trying to explain the center letter C <laughs> so building C group.com. And then I can be found at, uh, you know, on social media at uh, Scott Harris, Scott underscore Harris underscore building. Uh, so I'd love to get more questions. I think that was fun. It was great to kind of help some of these people because I think luxury home building should not be something that's not obtainable. It should be something that everyone has. Like, you know, I want to be the Henry Ford of, of uh, Model T. Everybody deserves to live well. We will share those each. The second Friday of each week, we will uh, of each month, we will have Scott on to answer your questions, share some DIY ideas with us as well. And Scott, always great to see you, sir. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again in September. All right, it's good to see you too. May you always make my day. <laughs> we do want to say thanks to our sponsor of today's episode, Smiley's Breezy Vapes. They're located at 313 Falcon Road in Altus, where they have Wacky Wednesdays. Stop by, they've got great specials each day, plus, like I said, Wacky Wednesdays. They've got new hardware and the largest selection of disposable flavors 
in Southwest Oklahoma. For more information, you can call or text 580-471-VAPE. That's 580-471-8273. Smiley's Breezy Vapes, 313 Falcon Road, here in Altus. Well, it is Friday the 13th, and here's how five common superstitions got started. Number one, Friday the 13th. Nobody knows for sure how it started, but one theory is that it has biblical origins and is tied to the number of guests at the Last Supper and Jesus' crucifixion on Good Friday. Number two, breaking a mirror. Ancient Romans believed that mirrors held a piece of your soul, and a separate myth said that our body renews itself every seven years. So those two things together helped create the seven years of bad luck thing. Number three, a black cat crossing your path. In the Middle Ages, black cats were associated with witchcraft and demons. And that snowballed into the idea that if a black cat crossed your path, they were blocking your connection to God and path to heaven. Number four, knocking on wood. The idea here came from ancient civilizations that believed trees house various spirits, and touching the tree would give you a protective blessing from those spirits. And number five, white lighters are bad luck. Now this has its roots in the 27 Club, where young musicians like Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, and Kurt Cobain all died at the age of 27. According to the superstition, they all had white lighters on them when they died, but big disposable lighters weren't even invented until 1973. And Hendrix and Joplin both died in 1970. Well, thanks again for joining us for this 123rd episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, a question, maybe anything else you'd like to know, you can hit me up on the contact page, GQ with Cam. Dot com. You can also find me on all the socials, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, all at GQ with Cam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, you can visit our merch store where we've got hoodies, shirts, tumblers, mugs, stickers, and more at GQ with Cam.com forward slash shop. And if you have a special guest idea, just email me GQ with Cam at Gmail. Com. Well, thanks again to Brandon Allen for coming up with our theme music, and thanks to our sponsor for today's episode, Smiley's Breezy Vapes at 313 Falcon Road in Altus. We're going to let Brandon play us on out and hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend. <laughs>